it's July, it's hot, it's humid. We're in a big, beautiful open field. Cannons are firing. There's a duel happening across the field. And it goes on for about an hour to two hours. It's non-stop bombardment. And then thousands of Confederate soldiers come out of the woods behind me here and across the fields to my left. And they make a dash across this field in grand formation towards the Union soldiers just ahead. Sound familiar? Maybe it might remind you of July 3rd, 1863, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. But we're not talking about Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. We're talking about a battle that happened long before that. July 1st, 1862, Malvern Hill. There's a place in Virginia that you can visit one of the better preserved battlefields that is so eerily similar to Gettysburg on day three that it's almost like somebody took the page right out of Robert E. Lee's books. But the ironic thing is that page happened long before Gettysburg happened. July 1st, 1862, there's a battle that happened right here at Malvern Hill in Virginia. And even though the artillery is so strong, and the Confederate artillery does nothing to hurt the artillery in this position. Robert E. Lee and the Confederate Army throw line after line of men up here and fight this position just to fail and back off. The casualties are almost double what the casualties were for the Union side. We'll talk about that battle today here at Malvern Hill. The battle out here, Malvern Hill, was one of the battles for the Seven Days Battles. It was actually the last one in the series, and it would cap off what would technically be, uh, I guess you could say, a Confederate victory overall, because the more powerful Union Army was pushed past this point and back to the James River, and it would effectively end the Peninsula Campaign to take Richmond. This farm is coming into the picture now was the West Farm. And at the time, the owner of the farm uh, was in distress, big distress about what was happening here on the field. Um, you gotta imagine, directly in my front, a few miles down the road was Glendale. And that's where the previous battle had just happened. So the people that were occupying this house probably heard all of the noise and saw the soldiers going back and forth and the wounded men that were being brought in all over these fields. And so as they're sitting there in their house and they're watching this stuff unfold, they start asking questions. What shall I do? Um, what can I do? And one of the suggestions that was given to them was that they would take uh, a red tablecloth off of their table and tie it to their house so that they could disrupt the Confederate cannons that were across the way from being able to angle in and fire accurately towards the house. Now the house behind me is a more modern house, although it's dilapidated and it's falling apart, so I wouldn't recommend going to that house to see it or even touching it. But uh, there was a smaller house that was placed here, and in the fields behind me you would have seen thousands of soldiers crammed in, getting ready for the fight. Um, one of the soldiers described it as a sight that I will probably never see again, although this war was far from over and they would definitely see it again. So as the Confederates came out from these positions over here and started making their way towards Malvern Hill, the artillery started to open up on them almost immediately. One soldier said, as soon as they made their appearance from the woods, our artillery opened on them with terrible effect. The air over their heads was filled with the smoke of bursting shells whose fragments plowed the ground halfway across the field and already their ranks show many gaps. 
That was from Charles Phillips of the 5th Massachusetts Light Artillery. It kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of what it looked like out here on this field. You have all this artillery that's placed on this hill, artillery opposing it over there, and Confederate soldiers are trying to make their way up. The time frames for this battle was somewhere between 1 and 3 in the afternoon. And then eventually, by the time dark fell, um, or when the light started going down in the skies, uh, that's when the last final big push came from the Confederate soldiers across that field. But it was all for naught. They had to cancel the plans and stop fighting by that evening. Now, as you can tell, I'm at the tail end of the, the green weather here, or the warmer weather in Virginia. Uh, the weather's starting to cool off a little bit as it, as it is right now. But during the time of the battle, that wasn't the case. It was extremely hot out here. We're talking probably 90s, 90% 90 humidity, and men are hoofing around out here on foot with wool uniforms on, 15 pound muskets, and probably anywhere between 15 to 25 pounds of gear on their bodies as they're going back and forth across these fields. So it was not an easy task to be a soldier out here on this field, just from the standpoint of the physical um, labor that you had to go through just to fight the battle. Not to mention the amount of stress and pressure you were under just to stay alive. Out here on this field, if you look off into the woods on the um, right hand side, as you're going past the farm, you'll see a large like divot in the ground, almost a ditch it looks like, uh, that goes straight across the field and down into the woods. And it, it's easy to think that, oh, that's another trench or something like that. But at the time, it was not a trench. There was no trench warfare going on, really during that campaign other than what happened on the outskirts of Richmond and the Peninsula Campaign in Yorktown and all of that. At this particular battle, there were many different roads that came through here and this was one of the farm lanes actually that was out here for traveling for horse and carriage. So um, that travel way is still out here and you can see it in the woods. I'm out here marching across the field myself at Malvern Hill and I've left where the farm is and I've gone down from the hill itself and then back up to a position to where I cannot see anything in front of me. And as I come to the top of that hill, all of a sudden, everything will clear right up and it will be a flat open plain and you'll be able to see the Confederate position once again. Well. This is very significant in terrain when it comes to battles. When you talk about the Confederates coming from that position over there and all across here, when they're coming from those positions and they're making their way this, this way, um, they're gonna have to also go across fields that are just like that. And just like at Antietam, they're not gonna see their intended target until they get to the top. And their intended target's actually gonna be a lot closer to them than what they're expecting when they get there. So now if you look directly behind me here, just over that hill is the crest of the hill from Malvern Hill where the cannons are placed. Out here in the direction where I am facing, uh, General Couch has his men forward deployed in case of a, an attack on that position behind me here because he didn't want the Confederates to get to the artillery and to stop their advantage because essentially the artillery is the advantage for this position. It rakes the entire field. It keeps it clean of men and prevents the Confederate soldiers from getting to that position and pushing their army further back. In this area, Abercrombie, uh, Howe, and Palmer are placed in this position. And directly behind me, which would be to my right, um, Couch's men ended up repelling D.H. Hill's men as they were coming up through here trying to charge through this vicinity to get to those cannons directly behind me there.
To give you an idea of where I'm at now on the field, I am well forward deployed of where the artillery would have been in front of the West House. And in the position directly where I'm standing, um, there would have been Barlow's men here and off to this direction over here, Couch would have been placed here. Dan Sickles is coming up from right behind me here. And then Kearney, off in this direction, right about where the woods are right there, his men would have been placed. So in the position that I'm in right now, um, D.H. Hill's men would have been just directly behind me where the parsonage is and over uh, past the hill because there was a safe haven for them to be placed in. Uh, this army had just come up from Glendale where there was a battle the day before. Directly off to my left-hand side over here, Jackson's men would have been placed with his artillery. And then off to the right-hand side, past these woods into a clearing was Magruder and his men. When we get over there to the clearing, we will actually go up through the field so that you can see what that position would have looked like if you were marching up through there as a soldier. And we'll talk about a soldier that lost his life over there and his photograph youthful photograph would become one of the most memorable photos of the Civil War and after the Civil War there would have been controversy surrounding it and how he actually died. Now I'm down in the woods here just behind the parsonage. Um, I don't know if you can see the parsonage up there or not but as you can tell this is a hill and it dips all the way down and the men would have been hugging the dirt back here trying to make sure that if a projectile comes over top of this hill they're not going to get hit um, as the further i go i go down the more this hill you can tell increases and then down here is also a stream of water that runs through here um, sadly enough the national battlefield was out here at the end of this trail and a body a couple of graves have been discovered out here they actually pulled the body from the earth and they were able to give it a proper burial uh, with, the, with the rest of the soldiers but the in, the impressions are still left in the ground over there and there's a sign that marks the location and out there's the woods the flat plain area where the soldiers would have been forming up just as I talked about earlier, um, this sign here details the fact that there are two graves that were out here and the depressions are pretty deep. You can actually still see them today. I'll turn the camera around here in a little bit and try to get a better view of it. Um, but Confederate soldiers were buried in these graves here and eventually they were removed and brought to Richmond to be buried in a cemetery. Um, I'm assuming for Confederate soldiers. The fields inside these woods here and the stream that's down below, it would have been shelter for the soldiers that were out here facing the battle that's, that's coming to them. Just like the position over there for the Union soldiers had shelter areas for them too, um, to try to protect themselves. But uh, considering the position they were in and the fight that they were about to be in, there was nothing that could save them out here. Uh, just lay low and hope for the best and eventually when a battle's over with what happens is the soldiers that are laying on the field that are dead they don't have a real crew to come out and take care of things so other soldiers are trying to bury them and other people in the area and so they're hastily burying them in the ground and it's not too deep so the soldiers would have been buried in small graves just like the ones that are directly behind me here So I'm walking along here now at Malvern Hill and the position that's directly behind me here is the actual crest of the hill where the cannon would have been spread out. And we're talking about 40 something cannon from slope to slope, end to end here, uh, laid out front for the main assault. And behind me would have been an open wheat field. 
Now the wheat at the beginning of the fight would have probably been pretty high, but then at some point in time, most of the wheat's trampled down. kind of hard to get a sense of what this field would have looked like back in 1862 because of all the trees that are here right now but out in that time there would have been wheat everywhere this field would have been cleared and if you can just look down in the field there you can see kind of a rolling hill the terrain is is pretty rough for soldiers to get across especially with obstacles in the way but it would have been cleared and you could have seen all the way across In this position here, uh, General Griffin and his men held this position. Those are soldiers from Pennsylvania and Massachusetts and Michigan and uh, some soldiers from New York. Confederates assaulted this line multiple times um, and the first few waves didn't make much of a difference. They were mowed down by canister, but eventually they actually made it to right about this point here. And then the cannons took them completely out. The fire was so heavy coming from this position that an assault on this position was not able to be reinforced. So what you have is just wave after wave of Confederate soldiers coming in and eventually being fought off and going back to where they were. Uh, there were dead and wounded soldiers all over this field out in front, laying and bleeding out in the wheat fields out here in Malvern Hill. Now, in this position, one Union soldier remembered that as the Confederates were coming on, we murdered them by the hundreds. That's a heck of a line to say about the soldiers that fought out here. But it's exactly what happened. By the hundreds, they were being swept off the field by cannon fire. I'm standing in a position where the 2nd Louisiana would have advanced itself to on the evening of the 1st of July, 1862, here at Malvern Hill. Now, directly behind me would have been a couple of slave cabins, and um, the Confederates in formation would have made it to that point. It's likely that they didn't make it any further past that in formation, only in uh, small uh, groups of men making their way towards the cannons. Very few made it up that far. But in this position, it's marked for a reason. And the reason why is because the second Louisiana was here. And a youthful picture was made of a young man by the name of Edwin F. Jemison. And Edwin was a Georgian by birth. And his picture was displayed prominently in the series, The Civil War by Ken Burns. And it was one of the more famous photographs during the American Civil War uh, because of how young and innocent the soldier looks in the photograph. But unfortunately for him, he was a 17-year-old man here fighting for the Confederacy, and he died here on this field, um, never to live past that 17 years. So out here, you can actually stand in the position where that man would have probably been, thanks to the signs that are on display here at the Malvern Hill, Hill Battlefield. Now, on July 2nd of 1862, a staff officer for the Confederacy had ridden up to this position where I'm at right now. 
And then he later writes about uh, the sad sight that he saw. He said that there was a long extending line of men that looked like they had all died in formation that extended from my right all the way to the left out into the woods. And they were lined up as if they were still in formation. And they had made one of those last final assaults on this hill and were taken out almost instantaneously when they got to about this position, which is roughly right in front of those cabins that I talked about where the second Louisiana was at. I'm standing out in one of the main Confederate artillery lines right now, facing the direction of the West House and the artillery pieces that stretched all the way across the slope here at Malvern Hill. And one of the other positions would have been at Poindexter Farm, which is off in this direction over here. Let's see if I can get my hand in the video off in this direction over here, about a mile and a half up the road, going towards Glendale. The purpose of this is so that the artillery is crossing sections of fire. So what's happening here is you've got artillery directly head on and artillery coming towards the Union from the right hand side, uh, if you were standing in the Union position. And the cannon fire is supposed to cross patterns and basically take out the artillery position ahead. So at about one o'clock, the cannons are set up and ready to go. Lee calls for artillery duel, basically, and starts to fire the cannons. Uh, they are firing for about two straight hours. Solid shell going across this field back and forth. The Union, on the other hand, has one thing that's going for them that the Confederates don't have. They've got the James River to their rear. The James River has the United States Navy on it and essentially they're firing overhead. Now the projectiles coming from the ships are not actually hitting much of anything out here, but what it is doing is it's showering uh, canister shot and fire from overhead and it's, it's creating havoc and disorganization and just scaring the heck out of the men that are out here on this field. Eventually the cannon fire is over with and uh, John B. Gordon and the Alabamians step off in this field at about 4 p.m. and they start making their way in that direction towards Malvern Hill at one of many of a series of charges across this field. Magruder's men are in this position where I'm standing right now. Uh, General Jackson is off in this direction along with D.H. Hill. Um, they continue to fight until it starts getting dusk and then at about 7 p.m., closer to 8 p.m., that's when the fighting settles down and it's, it's seen as there's no use of continuing to fight here, and so the attack stops. Meanwhile, during all of this fighting, Robert E. Lee is actually not on the field commanding at that time. He's riding around trying to find another position to get around the Union Army from Malvern Hill because he also recognizes what an impenetrable position this is. So that's kind of what happened here on July 1st that evening. So I'm walking from the Confederate artillery position now across Malvern Hill towards Malvern Hill, and out in the clearing over there you can see the vehicles in the house is where the Union artillery would have been. The Confederates would have marched through here in formation, and they would have had to contend with this position, which is gently rolling hills, and kind of like that march that we did the other day in Antietam, where we were going towards the second road at Bloody Lane. When you go through here, you have a series of hills they're going down and then back up until you get to a low-lying area that kind of shadows you from the enemy and keeps the artillery from hitting you. It flies over your head. And then you pop back up again once you get past these hills because now, as you can see here to the left-hand side, we cannot see that artillery position or that house. But when we come back up out of this clearing from the hills, and you see there's another position over here where it dips down and comes back up. As you come back up, you start to see the clearing again. Now, much of this field back then would have been wheat. So the wheat is being trampled down by the soldiers. So the cover that they did have from the wheat is starting to go away. And then the 
cannon fire is chopping the rest of it down. But the hills are what's really protecting the segments as they come through here. And now as I'm going back downhill, if you look off in the distance over here, and that clearing is really showing up now. And I'm dipping way down below where that house is. But then I'm about to come back up on a ridge again. And I'm fully exposed to every cannon that's about to be up here on this hill. Some estimates was around 40 to 45 cannon in place on the ridges in front of me. That's what they were facing going through here. And the Union Army, when it was in its position, had roughly 80,000 soldiers ready to go at any moment in time. And it didn't even have its full army deployed out here. It had plenty in reserves, along with the United States Navy, on the James River, firing overhead. It really makes you wonder, how did they not destroy the Confederate Army out here at Malvern Hill? now the evening of July 1st, 1862. The second Louisiana has been in the fight out here all day. And they're stepping off from roughly where I'm at right now. They've kind of been bogged down by the fight. In that second Louisiana is a 17 year old boy by the name of Edwin Jemison. He was born in Georgia and he would end up enlisting in the second Louisiana as a Confederate soldier. Why is he so important? Well, he's not a general. He's not a leader of any kind when it comes to his unit or the soldiers that are fighting out here. Nothing significant other than the fact that he was a soldier. But why he becomes important is his picture. He had a photograph made of himself before any real fight started to happen. He was 17 years old and he had a very uni uh, innocent, youthful face and in that picture he's staring back at the camera and you can almost see you see that future in his eyes it's almost as if he's staring into you someone that you can have a conversation with well that young man is fearing for his life while he's here on this hill and you can imagine he's probably hearing the cannons firing and the shells exploding overhead Men are falling around him left and right that are probably older than him. He's doing everything that he can to fight out here on this field for whatever reason he's fighting for. And he gets up here at another hill just right before the cannons. We're talking maybe a football field away. And then he goes down in combat. He ends up dying here on this field. Years and years later, the picture is widely spread talking about the youthfulness and the uh, valor of the soldiers in Louisiana. But a controversy happens. A man's going around camps, veteran camps, and telling the story of how he was at Malvern Hill. And he had seen the young Jemison fighting valiantly on this field when a cannonball flew overhead and took his head right off his shoulders. And he even described seeing the blood spurt up from the neck while his body drops to his knees and falls flat on the ground. But years later, come to find out, this man who claimed he had seen it all happen, turns out he was in a prisoner of war camp at the time. He couldn't have possibly been here on this field to fight at that time. And uh, his story, like many other stories from the veterans of the Civil War, was embellished, just like some of the letters written back home at the time of war. So, one thing is for certain, Edwin Jemison did die in the American Civil War, and it did happen here at Malvern Hill, roughly in the position where the sign is today on the battlefield. The picture of the youthful young 17-year-old man is, in fact, Edwin Jemison. He was from Georgia, he was born there, and he enlisted to be in the second Louisiana in the Confederacy. It is known where he's buried as well. How he died or the circumstances surrounding it here 
and Malvern Hill is just another mystery because no one really took note of what happened at that time. And that's the story of uh, Edwin Jemison. You can see his photograph um, prominently displayed in the Civil War, Ken Burns documentary, and in many of the books that uh, show photographs of the American Civil War. And I'll put it up here in this video too, so that you can see right about here, picture of Edwin Jemison. The muffled drum's sad roll has beat, the soldier's last tattoo. No more on life's parade shall meet, that brave and fallen few. On fame's eternal camping ground, her silent tents are spread, and glory guards with solemn round the bivouac of the dead. thoroughly enjoyed myself today bringing you out to um, Malvern Hill and taking you through the battle as it was on July 1st 1862 I always end up finding myself here at the cemetery or any cemetery near the battlefields that I go to to visit the soldiers and the primary reason is all war ends like this there's always a victor. There's always someone who's vanquished. But in the end, this is how it all ends. The men here laying in these graves sacrificed their lives so that we could be able to enjoy our freedoms. And for that, I'm thankful. Till next time. History with waffles.